So, Manjit, welcome to the show. Thank you, Cam. Thank you for having us in your wonderful house in this garden. Well, if it doesn't rain, it'll be a fantastic afternoon. We'll keep our fingers crossed. So, tell me, Manjit, you, you head up this fantastic organisation, Binti International, mm -hmm. and there's the word Binti itself. Where does that come from? Well, in Swahili, it means young lady. Mm -hmm. In Arabic, it's daughter. And in Punjabi, of course, it's a request for help, Punjabi and Hindi. Yeah, so there's there's true meaning behind it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that organisation uh, we'll come to a little bit later. I want to discuss a little bit about how you got here. So you started this organisation, what, about seven years ago? I did, yes. Um, but it wasn't always like that, like we said. So take us back to the beginning, you know, uh, you were born locally here. I was born in Hillingdon in West London. Mm -hmm. so I grew up in Southall. Right. Um, I have a, two brothers and one sister. And my parents or family came over to the UK in the late 50s, or my dad's judge came over in the late 50s. Okay. But all of your siblings were born here? We were, yeah. Except for my older brother. He was born in India. Okay. And I think he came over when he was about two. So Southall was an exciting place, wasn't it? It was. We had a, a lovely childhood, I would say. I remember living in a cul-de-sac and playing on the, um, the road mm -hmm. with nothing but bikes and our friends. Um, yeah, it was it was a safe cultural time, I think. Okay. And I went to Dormers Wells High School, which everybody in Southall knows. Um, we were kind of at the forefront for when the riots kicked off, the Southall yeah. riots. Mm -hmm. So that was a fun time. Well, or not, as, as the case may be, right? <laughs> yeah, if not. Um, <laughs> I guess in the sense that if we look at the historic history that um, I've grown up with, those are the kind of the times and the the era that uh, we grew up in. Yeah. How did that make you feel, the, the riots? I think we were quite safe from them. Um, I remember in high school, we had, in our classroom, there was a mixture of people, um, as in white, black and brown. And I remember one of these guys, um, his name was Robert, and he was, a, he was like the comedian in the class. He had floppy blonde hair. And then one day he came in and he just stopped talking to us and he'd shaved his head off right. and he'd become a skinhead overnight. So it was kind of a transitional period where uh, I guess there was always that cultural difference between knowing where we fit, whether mm -hmm. it was being Punjabi or whether it was being English. And um, I remember watching Gummel's uh, show a few weeks ago and hearing about how things changed from her growing up. Uh -huh. uh, I never really faced racism while we were growing, but obviously throughout my life um, I have uh, living in the UK. And I think when we were little, our parents wanted, they captured everything that was Punjabi about them and they wanted to instill that in us because they essentially left India, came here and they built a new life. Sure. And they didn't know anything else, right? Um, and it's only later in my life that I realized why they did that. Um, um, and I think, so the, the reason why I know that is when I went to the States, I took my two kids with me and I was adamant that I didn't want them to have, to lose their English accent, yeah. to wear American clothes, to wear, have that American culture. I was really strong in my, you're not going to speak properly, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> it's a little bit like that. And I think that made me realise why our parents were so strict with us while we were growing up. Yeah, because that's all they knew, right? Yeah. So you come to a foreign country, don't necessarily be able to speak the language. So you want to hang on to what it is that you had, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that you know. Yeah. So it's under like you said, you know, as you grow older, you do understand what your parents were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So we've had a few shows now, and um, I always think that, you know, when you're young and rebellious, you know, your parents are the worst things on earth. But as you grow older, you know, you make peace and grow a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. um, have you found the same? Yeah, I think when you have children, it makes you realise much sooner than when you don't, right? Mm. Because you, you become your parents and you recognise the things that you liked that your parents said and you know the ones that you didn't like. <laughs> you still say them, but and then you realise that you're behaving like them and that's where you tweak things to make it a little bit different. Sure. But I guess in my case also... Um, I would have done a lot of the things that my mother and father insisted upon with my kids as well, because okay. I didn't know any different until much later. Sure. 
So you got married? I got married when I was 19, did the arranged marriage thing. Wow. Had you met him before? Um, a lot like um, Gummel in the sense that uh, we had, an, uh, we had um, an introduction. Actually, we did do a face-to-face -face introduction and then about five months later we were married. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how long did the marriage last? Um, I would say about... It probably never was a marriage, actually. Um, mm -hmm. We got married and um, I remember on my wedding day we came, our, cult, our lives were very different, so I think his family must have come to the UK in the 70s and of course we were born there, so I always remember having those discussions with my parents, saying that when you get married, you know, you have to do what your mother-in-law says and I remember once saying to my mum that, of course I'm going to listen to her and I'm going to do everything that she says and if I don't, then you, I'll eat my shoe, because I was so adamant that I knew how to interact with that generation. Yes. But things weren't that great from the beginning. They were um, very different to what we were. Okay. Uh, so you never got on? When I say I should probably make it a little bit clearer. So when on my wedding day, in those days when you got married, it wasn't considered um, respectful if the bride danced on her wedding day. Do you remember those times? Okay. Right? Okay. It was very much... Uh, you're almost Shy a bride. spectator, yes, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, but his family was, they were full on, so I remember them taking me on the sta uh, on the dance floor, but then wanting to take me on the stage, and that was kind of where I put my foot down. Okay. And then I went into the toilets, and I was crying my eyes out, thinking, oh my God, what are they doing to me? And then my dad came into the toilets, and he said, you're theirs now. You've got to do what they say. And I think, and when I look back at it now, I think, oh my God, I can't remember, I can't imagine saying these things to my kids today but they do just kind of pass you on to someone yeah it is and you shocking, have to adapt it? yeah it's almost like property isn't it mm -hmm. you know that that this is this is you and up until today you were ours mm -hmm. and now to see one of the whole game and and i think when you when you make it sound like that transaction it's very different isn't it to when you're living in it because i would say that i never said no to my parents mm. i didn't know how to say no i wasn't allowed to say the word no and i think i probably only learned it in my 40s wow. you know generally we say we learn later in our lives anyway we just kind of go along with whatever everybody tells us to do right sure but i think from our perspective and what i realize now in my life is that maybe we were just because of colonization we did this hanji hanji for a long time yeah well we we you know our community is all about respecting elders and obviously your parents mm -hmm. your elders and your grandparents as well we mm -hmm. live in extended families mm -hmm. So a lot of that hanji hanji is uh, sort of taught to us mm -hmm. from the day we're born up, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. So it's programming, isn't it, at the yeah. end of the day? Yeah. So, so you get married and things are not good right from the get-go? Um, well, my father-in-law, ex-father-in-law, um, I think he was thrown out uh, before I got married, but he attended the wedding because of um, alcohol abuse and um, domestic violence. And then his oldest son did a similar thing his wife was beaten up she they separated and i guess okay. my husband thought or my ex-husband thought that it was okay to um do the same thing he didn't drink but there was domestic violence right from the beginning so it just followed the blueprint of that set by his father and his older brother mm -hmm. good god what a shame huh so how did you feel at that point when you <laughs> you, you obviously have all these expectations of, of being married and, and building a new life i think it, it wasn't even so much a um, this dream of being married. I didn't have that when I was younger. It was just more a case of um, how different it was from the life that I'd led with my parents. Where I mean, we, we, we grew up in a very strict household. We were at the Godwara every weekend, and but life was it was we were loved. It was, very, it was a very loving mm, environment. Yes. And of course, you know, as siblings, we all, we, all, we all lived in the same place, but we, and we may all say different things. But I knew that, I knew where I belonged. And when I was, when I was there, I didn't. I didn't fit in that space. Okay. And I think that was the, the struggle, because I tried, obviously. And I remember um, if there was ever an event, you know, they'd dress me up like a Christmas tree, put all the gold on. And then as soon as I'd get home, all the jewellery was put away and it, it just I came from a very simple family to one that was the extreme in Punjabi yes 
personified, you know, where everything was much louder. Yeah. So maybe spiritually, it was spirit. I came from a spiritual family and ended up in a loud Punjabi household where there there wasn't that connection to spirituality. And you didn't think that you had a voice to be able to say, "Look, I don't want to wear this, or I don't want to behave like this." Oh, I did. I mean, I wasn't. I was. I. I was when I was growing up. I was the one that stood up for everything. Mm -hmm. So, I um, I filled out the application forms for my mum or my dad for job up for job applications. Yes. I found HR and got them the interviews and things like that. So I was always at the front um, and standing up for anything. Yeah. So to be to be in a, an environment where my voice perhaps wasn't allowed, I still did speak. I still okay. said no. Uh-huh. I may not have said it really loudly, but I still said no. And I think that's where the disparity came in and that's where the issue started. Okay. Because if I said to um, my ex-husband that I didn't want to wear something, then I'd get the cold shoulder and I wasn't talk I wasn't allowed to say no. So it was much worse than not being allowed to say no with my own family. Does that mm. make sense? Yes, of course. Do you think it was him or do you think it was he was trying to please his mother or his, his, his family? Yeah, I think it was that there was a big element of that. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you, you start a family, have children? Yeah, my daughter... I got married when I was 19, I had my daughter at 20 and I had my son by 21 and by 22 I um, became a single parent. Wow, so only lasted what, three years, four years? It, it never, I mean, in that time, um, I tried to escape many times because um, it just wasn't working. But I suppose in, in that time period, it wasn't accepted if you, for you to sure. get divorced, right? So it was difficult to have that separation. So I, um, I remember um, one time my ex-husband had come to the house and he complained about something and my father stood up for me and he was ready to have a, a fight. So because he was ready to have a physical fight with my dad, um, I decided that that wasn't acceptable. So I left with him and went back to his house. Okay. And another time um, my jet came to my mother's house and my mum's mother had died and he his comment was what's she doing here my mother's at home and she's alive why is she here and she said he said it in front of everyone so it was just it's just culturally so different from yeah. that environment you know where there was no humanity or there was no um I don't know it's just now when I look back at it it's just I don't it doesn't make sense how people live their lives like that yeah it was a different world though wasn't it? A different it? world yeah. yeah different times different worlds i think one time i was told that i should leave my kids with him <laughs> it's like mm, yeah no yeah. that's not me and almost that transactional thing again isn't it that you know pawn the kids off on some on, on your partner so you're young and free and able to get married again i suppose that young and free i, d I didn't even think of that but yeah essentially it's like um yeah, so it's a transaction, isn't it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then this idea of the edge because you're married again. Mm -hmm. so, Maybe, yeah. Yeah. So you um, you bring up your children by yourself with your with I your did. parents' help? Yeah, my parents were always there for me. Um, my family was always there for me. Mm -hmm. But essentially, I had to pay the bills and work out how I was going to live my life. And I, I guess it, that fire inside of me um, was then allowed to start burning a little bit brighter and... Um, I was in sales, so I was determined to make money and um, be independent with the kids. Okay. And that's kind of where it started. So you started your career? I did, yeah. And how long did you work for? I worked all my life. Okay. Yeah. If I told you how many years, then I'd give away my age, so I probably won't do that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've worked all my life. Okay. So, and then, you know, you, you've got a career all this time. So what led to you starting Binti? Um, so about seven years ago, I used to work for the Sherry Blair Foundation okay. and I was a mentor for her organization and she um, helps women in the developing world to, uh, to build their businesses. Mm -hmm. So I was speaking to a young lady in Nairobi and um, I guess in, the, in that year I'd, I'd done a little bit of traveling and what I found was if, I, if you went to the Dubai, for example, all the women were covered from head right. to toe. Beautiful. You could you could see that they were beautiful and they were wearing you know attractive things underneath um, their burqa and everything. But it just felt, for me, it felt, this is just wrong. As in, 
Why can't women just be who they are, who so they want to be? seeing them in Dubai. Yeah. Um, I mean, lots of things, but that was just one of the things, right? Yeah, of right? course. And I, I went to Thailand, and in Thailand, I saw young girls dancing, you know, still with their baby fat. And I think it, it was just this idea of, um, I've worked, maybe I was just beginning to realize that perhaps I am a feminist and I want to continue to help women rise and stand up for themselves. Because I, I even, even today, I've never talked about um, my domestic, the domestic violence in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's kind of understanding that, well, perhaps if there was someone in that situation to know that there is ways out and there is hope and that you just have to find that inner strength to how want to it, create change. How did, how did it make you feel going from a, a, like you said, a very modern and loving family into one that clearly had, the violence was already there before you arrived and it just carried on with you? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that my family was modern either. Okay. You know, we were strict Punjabi Sikh household, but my father and mother were loving parents. Mm. And if I wanted to say no, I didn't like something, I could. I didn't say no to them if they asked me to do something, but I could tell them how I felt. Okay, so you had a voice. I had a voice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Going from that into uh, one where if I wanted to feed my own children, I had to feed my mother-in-law's sons first. Okay. It, it was just, it didn't make it was sense. Strict, very strict hierarchy in the, yeah. fa in the family. Yeah. I was just, I was, a, I was a someone else's daughter. Did you have any sister-in-laws? I did, and they, we weren't allowed to talk to each other. We all lived in the same house, but we weren't allowed to talk to each other. So the boys had everything, the precedent. So you had to feed, feed your brother-in-laws, yeah. but you didn't have to feed your sister-in-laws. They kind of came later, I suppose. Okay. But, you know, that we, we were, uh, in those days, we were, um, you'd have 10 or 20 people come at the sure, house sure, at the sure. weekend, and you'd be cooking all the time, so. Okay. Um, um, what about the violence? Where, when did that come, and how did that take place, and when? I guess it was just because um, maybe they weren't used to this idea that somebody may have a different opinion or... It wasn't that, you know, I, I, let me make it very clear also that I didn't, I didn't have a life then. I wasn't going out. I yeah. wasn't wearing Western clothes. I was in, my, in this house 24-7 and my parents actually lived a few doors down the road okay and I remember um, what I would do to see them I would stand at my bedroom window and as my father would come home I'd wave to him as my mother would come home I'd wave to her and so that, that was my life so you weren't allowed to come and see your parents I wasn't even allowed to go to see my parents who were two doors down wow good god so it, it was I guess now I can say it felt like it it's just one, it's probably the worst kind of um, relationship that you could have with a human being. Sure. It's that, it was that. Sure. So how did you, so you, you come out there, you're a single parent, and you know, um, that's not, a, not an uncommon place to be, especially these days. Mm -hmm. So how do you then end up working for Cherie Blair and you're, you're a mentor? How, does, how did that come about? I guess it was just um, I worked my way up through the, the, the ladder. I remember my first um, sales job was selling double glazing. Right? Right. So it was, I was a telephone sales queen, if you like, and I went through the ranks. Um, I used to work for this sweet uh, factory and I was in their telesales department and then three years later I was running the department. And then I guess I went into um, business sales and corporate sales. So just it was all about Sheer hard work. Me. Yeah. Sheer hard work, right? Uh, and I, di I didn't know any. I didn't know any other way. Okay. Right. I had to pay the bills, and I was good at what I did. So I used that t as much as I could. Okay. So you now, you know, you're seeing women around the world, and you're what's what's tugging at your heartstrings. What are you What are you feeling right now? I, I guess I should go back then because um, okay. just before that, um, I, I I was in this place where I didn't really know what I wanted to do next. So I had a major car accident in 2005. Okay. Um, and I was in a position where the surgeon had said, the only way you're gonna stop this pain is if you have your foot amputated. And I wasn't ready for to have my life drastically changed, but I did what I am good at. And I kept on researching and found the best orthopedic surgeon in the country who basically 
repaired and rebuilt my foot. Okay. And it took me five years to learn how to walk again. Mm -hmm. So I, came, I kind of went from a period in my life where everything was the way that it should be to one where I was kind of looking for my what's next. And I remember um, applying for different things and suddenly it dawned on me that I was a little bit too old right. or I wasn't young enough for some of those applications. Is that the feedback that you got or is that something that you felt? That was generally the feedback, I think, or the feeling I also got because I realized that perhaps I'm barking up the wrong tree because I was trying to find something different, maybe mm -hmm. retraining. Um, so I just kept trying new things and then eventually um, I started mentoring part-time at the weekends and that's mm -hmm. kind of how I fell upon the Sherry Blair Foundation. Right. So going to that time, I suppose, it was just, I had fire in my belly and I didn't really know what I was doing when I set the organization up. It was just one thing led to the next. Okay. Uh, so did you think that uh, it would be as big as it is today? Not at all, no, not when I first started. So what, did, what were you hoping to achieve when you set out? I wasn't, I didn't really have a plan, to be honest. I just <laughs> um, started doing some research and I remember the first bit of research took me to Nairobi. I interviewed uh, about 100 girls on the ground and some of the stories were horrific, from some selling themselves to others uh, using animal skin, cow dung, um, whilst others would sit on a hole for a week. Right. And the, the consequence of that is that the girls would drop out of school, um, get married again, you know, young child brides and that cycle of poverty is just perpetuated. Okay. I did a similar exercise in India and what I found in India was that if you ask a girl what a period is, there's just so much shame around that question. She doesn't know where the blood comes from, why she bleeds or how to take care of herself. And the stat at that time was that 12% of women in India uh, didn't have access to period products. So 12%, so 88% of women would use an old rag. Okay. And when we talk about an old rag, it's not like a white cotton thing. It's ripped saris, you know, the things that you would throw away with yes. sequins in them perhaps, or synthetic fib yes. fabric, right? And of course, with that comes um, disease and infection and things. So just this idea that women like i i would wouldn't consider myself very vulnerable at what but that one vulnerable time in the month if i didn't have access to a period product i know that i wouldn't have done anything in my life that i have done so that was kind of what in hindsight spurred me on to start it okay but why um menstruation why period products because obviously you you go around the world and women um, are oppressed in many many different ways there are many things that they don't have access to and there's many ways that they're discriminated against. So why did, why did this particular area of, of um, need appeal to you? See, I think, again, it's one of those questions that I can't answer because um, <laughs> I found myself passionate about periods, can you believe? Like, I, <laughs> I've been selling things all my life, always looking for the, the best company to work with, the most exciting product, and here I am talking about periods and... I've been around the world talking about periods and I'm on television talking about periods and radio about periods. So I don't know that it's, this is something bigger than I am that perhaps can answer that question. Okay. Did you, so do you now feel that, that this is your calling? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So obviously from our audience, you know, the Sikh community in particular, you know, it's one of those taboo subjects that is, isn't discussed or is it discussed? You know, what, what are your thoughts? Well, actually, I think when I first started, um, I didn't think that menstruation was a, an issue in our Sikh community. I didn't think that we were restricted in any way because of our periods. We went to the Gurdwara like everybody else. We were able to do seva like everybody else. But then um, as I started speaking to more and more women, the stories would come through. And, and of course, it's all cultural. It's not religion based, right? No. Well, the religion's pure, isn't it? Yes. So it doesn't discriminate. Man and woman's equal, etc. But the culture is different, isn't it? The culture is different. So you'll have the women that say, "Oh, man, gandhi, man, godwari ni jaa sakdi," or "Nee, nee, asi nee jaar share de," or not all women. I know today that not all women are allowed to do all seva in the godwara, okay. and that's the shocking thing. 
It's okay. absolutely shocking. So that's actually within rules and regulations or within customs that they, they can't do certain things at that time of the month? It's customs and misinformation and cultural nuances, right? Cultural interpretations, because there isn't anything in the Gurbani that says that you can't do something sure. while you're on your period. Yeah. So what are you and Binti doing now to change that? Well, um, it was kind of an interesting journey, but we signed up uh, the Khalsa Jata Godora in Shepherd's Bush mm -hmm. two years ago with a period policy which um, stipulates that they'll provide free products in their toilets for absolutely anybody, much like you can go to the Godora and have langar. This is where the idea came from. Okay. And that um, there isn't any restrictions around seva that you can do either. So um, I remember when I first started talking about periods in Punjabi, I said to my mum, I said, mum, how do you say periods in Punjabi or menstruation in Punjabi? And she said, monthly. <laughs> I said, mum. <laughs> <laughs> that's English. <laughs> <laughs> monthly is an English word. And, and then that's where my journey began of like understanding the language, right? How do you use the language around periods? How do you say, how do I use my, because I was finding myself in business meetings in India and in India, the, the funny thing is that I want to speak in Punjabi because I know how to, or I thought I knew how to, but they want to speak in English. Yes. Right. It's, it's the bizarrest thing. I remember the first meeting I had in India, there were um, three people in the room and I just sat there and my Punjabi and lagi. They're like, and I was really confused thinking, why are you looking at me like mm -hmm. I'm really strange? Yeah. And they said, well, you're speaking Punjabi very similar to what we heard in the 60s from the villages. That's right. And yes. that was really shocking for yes. me. It's like, what do you mean? Mm. I've been speaking Punjabi all my life and I thought I was relatively good at it. And if I go back to Punjab, everybody understands me. So to be in, a, in the middle class in India, uh, to have that conversation there, it kind of threw me. Yeah. But, but of course, um, the language of commerce in India is English, isn't it, as well? It is. So it's a two-way thing. A, you know, I think sometimes they're trying to impress you. And the other is that that is, that is the, the common language of business in India. Oh, but you, you jump in a taxi and you speak in Punjabi with a taxi driver and he even, he can't compile two words of, in English, but he'll speak back in English. And that's, that's just the, <laughs> that's just, it's so wrong. I don't yes. understand it. But I guess, you know, they're holding on to, they're trying to become westernized. Yeah. And we're trying to hold on to everything right. that we, right. we need to. So Manji, tell me what is the word? Because you actually haven't told us. <laughs> Apart from monthly, obviously. Uh -huh. I mean, there's so many. There's uh, Mahavari, okay. which is, again, the time of the month for the right. woman. Um, and there's uh, generally, there's lots of um, slang words. Okay. But in Punjab, you'll hear the girls say Mahina, or okay. some of them will say period now. Okay. Monthly. So do you do you think that it's being the, the word is being danced around because the subject is still very taboo? Absolutely. And, and from my own perspective, what I realise is that my language is limited or was limited around these kind of conversations, right? Yeah. So for me, when I'm speaking Punjabi, I, I'd use words like dimi and um, janani and orat. And now when I'm talking about this, the work that I do in Punjabi, I still haven't mastered how to say it okay. in a coherent sentence you know, that I could use in a, in a, in a, um, at work. Okay. It's still taking time to master that. Do you still find that it shocks people, uh, what you do and what you talk about? It's not so much shocking as it is, um, disbelief. Why? Why disbelief? Because they don't want to, they don't want to, um, admit that this is an issue. I mean, even in the UK, right? Even in the UK, we still use blue liquid to show the absorbency of period products. Yeah, I was. Um, it's, um, I mean, before the show, we were talking, and uh, in my research, I, I read that. And one of the things that I find really surprising is that we have um, um, poverty around the supply and, and being able to purchase these items and the actual availability. So, do you want to talk about that in terms of you know you've got views on why they the, the tampon is tampons is the right word mm -hmm. are available or not available free. In public toilets yeah i think um there's so much that's happened in that six years of the work that we've done and um looking at where we are today 
with the lockdown and everything. One of the recent, a uh, recent survey was done in one in three girls in the UK did not have access or could not afford period products. And, and that- One in three. One in three. In the UK. In the UK. The fifth largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm they can't afford or have access to. Yes. Yeah. So there's two separate things there, aren't there? So mm -hmm. what, what does uh, not having access actually mean? Not having access might mean that, uh, so for example, the government this year announced that they would f provide free products for schools, um, for girls in all schools uh, in the country. And of course, with lockdown, the girls weren't able to get, get into school and they wouldn't have had access that way. Okay. But also things flying off the shelf um, with stockpiling, people stockpiling period products. Okay. But just imagine all the, if we're talking, looking at food banks and the, uh, the rise of the amount of people using food banks. Well, it's the same for period products. You know, when there's a natural disaster, yeah. we do drop food, we do drop water, but we don't drop period products and women still bleed. Okay, of course. It's, that, it's kind of, if you think, start thinking it from that perspective, then it gives you an idea of, well, okay, you know, not everybody can afford these things. So we don't regard um, these products as a necessity, do we? Is that the problem? Yeah, it's, 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 can you imagine walking around? Well, when you go to India, do you have to grab toilet paper? Do you? Do you, do you go to India much? Uh, yes. Yeah. There's not many, many places with even toilet paper there in isn't, India. Is there? No. It's, it's kind of, it's a shock to the system. So when you're packing to go to India, you always take toilet paper. Well, I always take toilet paper with me. Yes. And I have to make sure that I've got toilet paper with me in my bag. Yes. Right. And it's it's that kind of mindset. Why do we do that? Well, because there it's not available everywhere. Yes. And what we find in the UK is that most women actually use toilet paper in between buying period products. Why is that? Because we might start and we don't have something in our bag. Okay. So then we would go to the toilet and we would use toilet paper mm -hmm. or we would be having a meeting and suddenly we start so we would excuse ourselves go to the toilet use toilet paper until we we're able to buy some okay but you have an idea for a solution for that problem don't you yeah what would absolutely. It be? yeah i think that period products should be available in all public spaces just like toilet paper and soapers okay and even employers right what they'll find is that their toilet paper consumption will decrease and it will kind of pay for a period products to be in in the workplace so as an employer um, if they were saying look it's an additional cost to us it's offset by the fact that their the, the use of toilet paper will go down correspondingly. Yeah, and, al and also just if they look at the numbers of if I was at work and I had to leave the office to go and buy period products it can take me about half an hour mm -hmm. 15 minutes to get there 15 minutes to come back I might have to change my clothing so another 15 minutes that's 45 minutes a month that I would have to waste in my life at work, which obviously equates to cost, where if they had the product in the toilet, then I'm just so do the sum. Em so employers in this country mm -hmm. don't supply free sanitary towels in their female toilets? No. That seems crazy to me. Yeah, they've never supplied them. Right, okay. So with... But they have bins. So you can okay. throw your period <laughs> products in the bins, but they and that's actually part of policy. Um, but this isn't, and this is what we're trying to push for policy change right now. Okay, how much of that do you think's got to do with the fact that most large companies are run mostly by men? It's absolutely got everything to do with it. I mean, I I still don't know who it was that decided that toilet paper would be available in all public toilets. I still don't know who the chap is because I can't find his name. But it right. must have been someone who decided this, right? Yes, of course. Somebody and, made a decision. And as we were growing up, right, do you remember we used to get the tracing paper and yes. the little square things? Yep. And eventually became yes. that change. The tish tissue paper it became, yeah. didn't yeah. it? So it must have been a guy, right? Absolutely. Because if it had been a girl, she'd have put tampons in there as well. <laughs> Period pro pads. <laughs> Period yeah. pro yeah. Okay, right. Pads, yeah. Yeah, okay. So now... But actually, she may have done if she was ballsy enough to think that that was something that could help someone because mm. you know the, the other thing is that women don't necessarily feel brave enough to create these changes sometimes is there a fear around yeah absolutely why well because you want to uh, even this idea of um if we were to consider the menstrual policies or period policies at work which would stipulate that women are allowed to take time off 
from work if they're suffering with period pain. Mm -hmm. Women don't necessarily tell their employer that they've got period pain. They might say they've got a headache or a bellyache or something else. They don't want to admit it because they're in fear of discrimination. Okay, so Binch is educating employers as well as, as, as users? Yeah, so we started up our education program um, six years ago. Uh, we, it's a bespoke program that covers the biology, the emotional side, because it's only now through my work that I realized that every month when I thought my life was going to end, it was because my period was going to start. Right. So we talk about the emotional side, we explore the cultural side, the cultural side being one that we look at all of the nuances in, in the countries or towns that people live in. Mm -hmm. So for example, it would cover the fact that we stick products up our sleeves in the UK, or in India, you can't go to the mandir if you're on your period, mm -hmm. or can't touch the, the pickle, can't touch the crops, things like that. I get um, everything else. I don't get the pickle. They had to charge ballion a jar crab with them there. Really? Yeah. Wow. And does Even, it actually do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. <laughs> so it's quite an easy thing to prove or disprove, right? It is, but it's it's um, again about creating people to think for themselves. Mm. So when we provide the education, it's very much um, intera It's interactive. It's to like we just did with you, you know, to talk about well. What would happen to the jar? I mean, if, if I had it in a jar bottle and I didn't yeah. wash my hands and I put my hand inside, yeah, perhaps it would go off. Yes, but if of I'm touching it from the outside, how, how is that going to... Oh, okay. So not, not, not just that I can't put my hand in, I can't no, pick no, up no. the jar. You can't touch the it's jar. It's going to contaminate it. You're going to contaminate it. Wow. You're going to contaminate the crops if you grow the crops. If you see your husband's face while you're on your period, he's going to drop down and die. These, these things. Extremes. It's incredible, isn't it? Some girls are told they have to sleep outside. They sleep in the, in the forest or in a different house. How do you overcome, you know, it seems such a huge problem. So, you know, you've started, obviously. How many country, countries are you guys in now? We're in about 17 different countries. 17 countries. Mm -hmm. and, I've, and, and the list, again, surprised me. The United States, you know, Switzerland. Um, I would expect those that, that list to be just full of third world countries, but it's not, is it? Well, it's again, it's something that isn't talked about. And because it's not talked about or hasn't been talked about, nobody's been aware of the fact that we're just suffering quietly as women. Okay. You know, when we have health issues around periods, we could go to our GP and try and talk about the issue. But GPs get 15 minutes of training in their medical they they want they they will keep pushing you back mm. if you have period issues. So there's so many there's so many things that are affected. Or so many th women are affected so many ways because of this lack of education. Wow. Do you know how many days of of work and um, productivity are lost in any country due to women being sick uh, and not being able to go into work and not being able to just be honest with their employer? And then, as you say, not having these products at work and having to take that 45 minutes, that hour out and and perhaps having to, to, to go home and change your clothes, etc. I mean, we don't have numbers because no one's ever done the research, right? It'd be interesting, wouldn't it? It would. I remember being in a meeting with um, a very large manufacturing organisation. And when I told them about the work that we were doing, this was five years ago, they said to me, so have you done any research? Have you um, done any questionnaires? And I was thinking, hang on, okay, hang on a minute. I'm a small charity and I'm telling you this is the problem. And this is because we've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of girls. Mm -hmm. And you're an organization that's been around for like 50 years, 60 years, and you don't know these things. I mean, shouldn't you be doing the, uh, the questionnaires right. or the research? And what was the answer to that? Blank. Mm. How many people in that meeting? There were six people in the meeting. How many men? Uh, there was no men, actually. Sorry? There was no men. So all, However, all, yeah. <laughs> what they did say was that um, they would go back to their research team and that they would do the um, the work. The necessary research. And what? Yes. Anything come out of that? No, because they're all men, white men, middle class. Okay. So it's. It, do you think that that's the problem that it's seen as a, as a, a women's problem? It is, but I think as an organisation, or what I know from my own experience is that if I was talking to a boardroom full of men, 
I would focus on all the numbers, right? Yes. This is the number, is the number of the girls that will drop out of school. For example, if you keep an additional 10% of girls in a school in a country, you can increase the GDP by 2%. Yes. Right, so this is the kind of stuff they want to hear. Yes. I mean, so, but from, from a corporate point of view, though, that is, it's, it's understandable, isn't it? Hmm. That if you suddenly started talking about loss of production, you know, loss of days of work, etc., then the corporate world understands that, doesn't it, better than, uh, you know, all the emotional side of things. But I, I had a conversation with the Gyanni as well, and the Gyanni said to me... How did that go? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I've done some crazy things in my life. I've talked about periods in a godlara, okay. part of the Sangat, so that was probably the scariest thing I ever did. But I remember when I was speaking... Who was to... the most scared? You or the Sangat? I think it was me. I don't know about the Sangat. <laughs> <laughs> they may have been. <laughs> but it, it's because it, you, you grow up thinking that you can't say certain words, right? So how could anyone ever talk about period or say the word period in a godwara? Because it's just sacrilegious, right? You, it, I, I spoke to the Gyanni. The Gyanni knew who I was. He knew that I was the woman that ran this organization called Binti and that we were going to be rolling out the, um, the period policy there. Mm -hmm. And he told me that he was the Gyanni from Bangla Sahib. And he said, what about when he said, but you know, you can understand if a woman comes into the Gurdwara and maybe she stains the chadar that maybe this isn't the right thing. I said, you're right, you know, that could happen. I said, but also you could have a man who came in from outside, his feet are dirty and he could also make the chadar dirty, right? Mm. I said, but what about the difference between the fact that this, a woman, she is yearning to pray to God. She has the purest of heart and she's yearning to pray to God and she's also menstruating because that's usually the time when we reflect the most, right? Okay. Are you saying that she shouldn't be there but some a man who may have not pure thoughts or dirty thoughts or whatever, but he has a better right because he's not bleeding if if God's the one who gave us this uh, this beautiful way of generating the next generation by yeah, because it's life, isn't it? It's life, it? isn't yes. it? Yeah. And he said, <laughs> And I thought, okay, I'm, I, I mean, I was, I think when I get into the conversation, I'm fearless. It's always the, the thinking, oh, I'm going to do this. And then it's a bit more scary. But once I'm in it, I'm fine. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, when we talked about uh, doing this show, you said to me, you do know that I'm going to talk about periods, right? And so was that, are you, are you the person that's, uh, you know, more apprehensive than, than sometimes your audience is? Because I obviously knew what you did. Um, I guess, again, like I, I think I said earlier, it's not so much the, um, the apprehension as it is. I know with confidence now, like I remember in the early days when I started talking about my work, I thought, oh my God, what if I go to the Brind and I start talking about this? They might, they might throw me out or stone, you, stone me or right throw you out yes but what i realize is that the conversation that i'm having is it it's boxed it's only about menstruation yeah i i know that the shame comes from the fact that when girls reach menstrual age if they were to have sex then they could have babies and that's where the shame comes from so we don't talk about the reproduction mm -hmm. you know it's okay. completely completely about menstruation mm. because you know, in the in the West, they teach you if the egg isn't fertilized, then the period w will start. Yes. Right. The egg isn't going to be fertilized between ages of nine till much later in life anyway. So why even talk about that? That's not why a period starts. A period will start. Girls are not thinking about fertility or reproduction until much later. So yes. let's just keep that away from the education. OK. So now I know that even if I went into a Muslim community or into any community, because my teaching is about empowering girls to understand their own body, that I, nobody could say no, right? No. But they do say no, yes? No. No? They don't, no. I've never had anyone say no to me. Okay. So we've got the Shepherd's Bush uh, Godwara. Mm -hmm. um, that's rolled this out. Mm -hmm. Any others following suit? 
Yeah, we've worked with a number of organisations and I guess um, one of the largest ones this year was um, the Khalsa Academy School in Wolverhampton. Yeah. And what they're doing is they're providing free products for anybody that comes to the school. Mm -hmm. So from guests, from staff, uh, teaching assistants, absolutely anyone. Okay. And, that's, and, and, they're, and they're using all of our marketing, um, the Binti stickers yep. on premises mm -hmm. because that kind of creates that conversation. So I remember when we presented there um, a couple of years ago and the kids in the, the hall were quite shocked and horrified that I was talking about periods and you could see the girls were kind of disappearing under the chairs and the boys were just giggling Yes, because they couldn't imagine that we were having this conversation. But today... How old were they? they were, uh, I think that they were the sixth formers back... Oh, sorry, not sixth formers, the fifth formers. Okay. So they were the oldest in that, yes. in that school at that time. So they would all have known about this, but they're still yeah. giggling and girls are still... No, because the thing is, even though we have sex education in school, most of us aren't paying attention or mm. they, the way that they talk about it is in, what, in one that we don't really understand it. Right. You, you must have had it in school, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did sure. you say that you know everything about periods and menstruation? Absolutely not. Exactly. And even I, I, I mean, even women, right? We, we start bleeding as young as nine years old. We bleed every month for nearly four decades of our lives. And we, we learn on the job. Mm. Nobody tells us. When I started um, age 10 or 11, I remember being terrified, thinking, what have I done that I've got this stain in my um, underwear? And I went to my mum and told her, and she had that look on her face. Mm. 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 That look on her face, which meant, and she gave me a pad, and it meant, don't ever talk about this again. Wow. So that was your complete education. Yeah. But that's very common for most, most of us. And um, what we find in places like India is when I tell them my story, I give them permission to talk about their story. And that's where the, the real stories come out. Okay, and do they share? Yeah, they do, because you give permission. And, and, and we've never talked about our period stories, but we all have good, bad and ugly stories. And we have so many that we can share. And that's how you empower each other, because you make them believe that they're normal. And yes. that it's okay to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And if they, you know, in a class of say um, 100, we'll have at least seven or eight girls who will have serious period problems and they find the courage to talk about them. Okay. What are those problems? Could be that they're bleeding for um, every day for like three weeks, um, that they're not bleeding, that they have other illnesses um, that need to be taken care of, um, but generally just this complete idea that periods are dirty. So that would then lead um, to those girls not going to their doctors, not talking to somebody about it, because inherently that, that single thing is seen as somehow unclean mm -hmm. um, and something that's there's something wrong. So, so are there other medical conditions that, that go um, unnoticed, untreated? Yeah, there's there's many of them. There's you know there's menstrual disorders that um, are listed, and if you don't know what a normal period is, if we're not taught what a normal period is, how would we know what's abnormal? Okay. Because every girl's period is different from each other, right? Some may bleed um, two or three days, others may bleed eight or nine days. What's normal? Everyone's cycle is normal, dependent on how that sure. they are. What's what's the education uh, in schools in this country like for that subject now? Uh, we, we are rolling out our own education program, which is 360 and multifaceted to cover all those areas because I don't think we're taught enough. So it's still not happening in school. Binti's having to do that. Well, we're, we're doing that. So my 13-year-old son, he had um, sex education a couple of years ago. And I remember him coming home and saying, oh, mummy, I had sex education. I thought, oh, you know, the normal, oh, my God, don't ask me any questions <laughs> feeling went through me. But then... Um, yeah, it was quite shocking. He said that the boys and the girls were separated um, and that they told the girls if the boys ask what this is, just tell them it's so sweet. So there's still that we're keeping this shame mm. continuing. Mm. Do you think it's um, a subject that's better taught by um, your parents or not your parents, as it were? You know, is it something that 
girls should be taught by not necessarily their mothers because all those emotions are, are around that subject? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, I think we need to give tools to the community so that mm -hmm. they can understand how to talk about it. You sure. know, even, even our training, when we train our trainers, we have to ensure that when they're training that they're not passing on their own shame to the kids. Right, so it has to be multifaceted. We, we can't change the generations that have gone, but sure. we can certainly, in the next uh, wave of teaching, ensure that the boys are taught that it's normal. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, we need to let the girls have their own education so that they can ask their own questions so that they're empowered to take care of themselves. But the boys should be taught that too. Mm -hmm. The boys should understand their puberty. Girls should understand boys' puberty. Because it's a little bit late that you learn about it when you get married or you don't never <laughs> yes. learn about it, right? It's just, we have enough to cope with. Sure, sure. And it's a difficult time, you know, puberty and, you know, at that, that particular age. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for boys and girls, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. So let me just take you back to the, the Academy in Wolverhampton. So how long has that program been running there? We've been working with them for about two years now. Okay. And um, we're, we're very much part of the school. So we teach every month. They've developed the education program that's being rolled out through their whole school. Mm -hmm. The kids are getting involved with us from a charitable perspective. Um, obviously, we have period products that are delivered, are available for any of the girls. We've got a couple of sewing club projects where we give them free period bags and we give them lavender bags, which help with period pain. We just want it to be completely normal. Sure. And at some point, we'll start talking to the community and getting the community the parents involved as well in that okay. discussion. Have you have you measured anything in terms of what the res what are the results looking like after two years? I think I, one of we had um, some voice notes come through from the school last week, and just uh, we rolled the uh, the marketing campaign out about two months ago, mm -hmm. and the teachers are finding that the kids are just openly discussing periods okay and they, they have this feeling that the shame is beginning to go and it's just you know when you see it you see a binti sticker and it says that period products are available here mm -hmm. you can either choose to ignore it or you can ask someone what that means and yes even the male teachers are questioning what that actually is and what do you mean it's not available for everyone you know so that conversation yeah. has really started good Good. So, because that's the idea, isn't it? Start the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, where does it go from the Gurdwara in Shepherd's Bush, and from the Academy in Wolverhampton? Where, where next? What needs to happen? Um, I guess. So last year we were in India. We celebrated five years, and we did a car rally mm -hmm. across okay. um, thirteen different cities, and we delivered um, about thirteen hundred pad kits. And I remember when we were putting together the plan of how we were going to um, do this, I thought, let's stick some pads on the car and we'll write smash shame on them. We'll write? Smash shame on them. Okay. So we had a pad car, literally we had a car covered in pads and all of our stickers and messages on. And I remember the first day that we were um, getting the car ready, I sent a message back to the team in the UK. I said, look, Car's nearly ready. We've got the pads on there. If anything happens and when I get arrested, make sure you call this person. Because <laughs> I didn't know that they would. I, I was terrified of thinking, well, somebody might not like this. Yes. But it needed to be done. And then there was just this crazy thing that happened where whenever we would pass through streets, I mean, most of them didn't even know what it was, right? Sure. Most people, most guys have never opened a packet, like a packet of pads. No, but why would they? Why would they? Because they're, they're horrified. Yeah. Right? They're horrified by this idea. It's not, it's a clean, mm. it's, it's never been used. But yeah. Why wouldn't they open it? So that sure. they know, because one day they might be a father or they might need to give it to a girl. So they should know what it is, right? Mm -hmm. But we weren't, we weren't, um, we didn't get into any trouble. And like I said, most people didn't know what it was, but the people who did know what it was, you know, you could just see these big smiles on their face. Thinking, <laughs> what are they doing? This is really cool. Um, yes. So, yeah, I guess it's just continuing to do things like that where we can normalise their conversation. Yeah. And we should smile about it, shouldn't we? And then that lightens the whole subject, doesn't mm -hmm. it? 
Yes? It should, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Okay. So you have volunteers, how many? Um, we have between 70 and 90, depending on what time of the year it is. Yeah. So what's the mix between women and men? Um, it's very much mixed. I guess we've got about 10% that are men. Okay. So we're very diverse. We've got a team of um, young and old, uh, black, brown and white. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important uh, to understand that the language we use is different, right? So uh, we do come from... I mean, we're British first, but we also understand cultural nuances. So of course. When we, when we first started, we had a stand at Canary Wharf. You know, I was in the financial district of the world, but we had very clear instructions that we weren't allowed to use the word blood or bloody, um, and that we needed to be careful that we didn't create, um, even, in our, even in our literature, that we didn't create um, too much of a nuisance by okay. what we were talking about. I don't know if that makes sense, but essentially... It doesn't make any sense to me. How it is it a nuisance, well, you know, <laughs> but only, only corporate people It needed would to say be classy, that. right? Yes. It needed to be classy. We were talking about something that nobody really wanted to talk about. It had never been talked about before, mm. but we needed to be stay classy. So right from the beginning, I've kind of maintained that nuance of making sure that we look at the audience that we're speaking to and we use the language based sure. around that. Sure. So for example, the changes in language over the years has been that we don't use the word sanitary. In India, they call them sanitary napkins. Okay. I don't know where napkins comes from. Mm. But if you have access to period products, there's nothing sanitary about it, right? Sure, yes. Feminine hygiene, what does hygiene mean? It's feminine health. Mm. Let's use the correct language. Yes. Because that's, if we change the language that we're using, then we're kind of changing how we associate of and how we feel about periods as well. Sure. How do people get involved in your organisation? Um, there's many ways. They can volunteer with us, obviously they donate with, um, if they want period products in their workplace to get in touch, uh, go to our website. We're quite big on the social medias platforms, mm -hmm. so Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Binti Period, our website is bintiperiod.org. Um, yeah, we're, we're always looking for people because it. This is about this is a this is about the sangha. Right? Sure. This is all about us creating change for the next ge generation. And I only know what I know, and I know that there's lot more, lots more to learn. Sure. And we can only learn more by having different conversations with different people. Yes, absolutely. So the future for Binti, where does it go next? What What are the plans? We've launched in the US, um, we're already in India, and I think it's just a case of, well, let's get into the corporate world and get this conversation into board meetings. If we're looking at equality, even in our own community, if we haven't had those discussions about periods with our par parents, we should, because it's the scariest thing when you first start, but once you start, you give them permission to share their stories and how they did things, and it just builds commonality and spirit and makes the foundation stronger and it gives you the courage to talk about other things sure there's so many things that we don't talk about of but, course um and i and i think periods are the foundation of life so once you've had that discussion you can kind of talk about anything so in terms of a, a message to to our audience and our community you know what would you say to to the daughters and the mothers and the fathers and the brothers you know what should we be doing uh, right now to help the situation? If, um, as Sikhs, we're of course. all about equality, right? And if we're going to ever have equality, rather than it just being hearsay, we've got to look at how what we're doing on an individual basis to ensure that our girls are able to talk about things that they need to, mm -hmm. make it open so that they can have that discussion. Um, if you can talk about periods, you can talk about anything. Sure. Um, so get involved with the idea of having those discussions of topics that are difficult. Because if you want honesty, the only way to be honest is to be true to yourself. And if something's bothering you, then get it off your chest and um, share it. Fantastic. My dear, thank you so much for a, allowing you us to um, come into your home and for uh, discussing this topic. I've certainly been educated. I hope that our audience is too. So thank you so much.
Thank you, Cam. That was uh, amazing. And it went really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it always does. So, guys, thank you for joining us today. So that's the end of the show. So until next time, I bid you goodbye and we'll see you again.